Good Tuesday morning, Brentwood seniors. I uh, hope you have been looking uh, since yesterday for other examples of critical theory of uh, uh, the way that our culture is affirming those ideas. Uh, today, in this video, we're going to be looking at some positives about critical theory and thinking through how that reflects on the Christian faith. Uh, and then be sure and join, join me this afternoon at two o'clock when we will uh, again, be discussing some of those positives and be thinking through how does that work in our culture. All right, uh, I'd like to begin today a little differently. I'd like to read a selection from Psalm 89 and offer a brief prayer after that, because this may help us set up uh, what we're going to be looking at today from Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known throughout all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. Verse five, the heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you? Lord God Almighty, you, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Now, verse 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. For you are their glory and strength, and by your favor, you exalt our horn, our power. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, our ruler. You could even say today, our government, our military, political, business leaders belong or under the sovereign control of the Holy One of Israel. Father, we thank you that you continue to work today. Father, I ask that you use us as your emissaries, as reflections of your light. Help us, Father, as we talk today to see uh, some of the, the good things that the culture is saying, some of the ways that we can join in. But also, Father, give us wisdom and insight to know how to respond in a way which honors you and does not end up short-circuiting your will in this world. Be with us today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Give me just a moment to open the screen here. There we go. You remember this chart here on the right. And as we begin here, I want to review real quickly from yesterday uh, the big ideas of critical theory. First of all, that our identity as individuals are inseparable from our identity in our member groups. Now that's not to say that they aren't strongly formed, they are strongly formed, but key insight, key belief of critical theory is that we are inseparably tied in to those member groups. Number two, a key part of critical theory is to look for the identities of these oppressor groups and the identities of the oppressed groups and to see how the groups who have power, have control, are oppressing through social norms, expectations, understandings, both explicitly proclaimed and then just innate in the culture itself. Third, critical theorists believe our fundamental, our primary moral duty is to work for the liberation of the oppressed, whatever it takes. That is the goal. Fourth, this is one of the corollaries that flows out of this. Lived experience is more trustworthy. It's a more valid kind of truth, a source of truth, than objective evidence or reason. Uh, we get from this a phrase you often hear around, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. All right. Or you even, I, I read an article just today of a situation in which uh, there was a dispute between two people, two, in a sense, leaders of a, of a movement. And one of them said, well, 
she has the right to say, to speak her truth. I, all right. But what is the truth? Big T. All right. Uh, fifth, privileged groups, again, tend to promote their own agenda under the guise of objectivity. This is the way it is. This is the way all right thinking people would see this. And no one even thinks to question. And last of all, individuals who are part of more than one oppressed group experience a, a concept called intersectionality. And that's not just that they're a member of this oppressed group and suffer from this, and then they also suffer from this type of oppression as a member of another group, but actually it is not only quantitatively more, but it's qualitatively different. So in other words, we not only have large groups, but we have micro groups moving and forming around so that uh, it, it, it becomes in a sense a mosaic of different groups, different oppressed groups, each working uh, in this mix to try and find the truth that is true for them, you might say. All right, let's spend a, a little bit of time talking about some of the positives, some of the things that as Christians we can look at and go, yes, understood. First of all, critical theorists recognize that oppression is immoral and ought to be opposed, all right? Because all truth is God's truth. We as believers can hear this and go, all right, the fact that that is true, the fact that that not only resonates, but actually is supported in the biblical story says that we need to be pay atten paying attention. And maybe we have not seen as we should have. Uh, the central action of the entire Old Testament was what? I hope you picked this up in Old Testament theology last year. Yes, the crossing of the Red Sea, the freeing of the slaves in Egypt. In fact, in that central passage, in, in, in Exodus, when God reveals from himself from Mount Sinai and speaks the 10 words, as the Hebrews count them, the first word is not the first command. The first word is this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You can almost put it there for, you shall have no other gods before me, in front of me, beside me, no other God except me. All right, this flows out of God's saving act. He heard their cries and he responded. And again, we as, as followers of Almighty God, as ones who are called to be holy as he is, ought to be hearing that same call. Think about how the prophets called for, for the people of Israel to respond in holiness, in justice, and rightness. Remember the passage from Micah chapter 6. And what does the Lord require of you that you act justly and that you love mercy and that you walk not in power and in oppression but you walk humbly there beside your God who is the one in ultimate control right this resonates it, it critical theorists have pointed out something that Christians have recognized sometimes within different times we may not see it as well. Second, critical theorists insist that power corrupts, that groups with institutional power create laws, they create systems of, of operation, systems that we call them of oppression, norms, this is what everyone does, and even, this is, and this is one we need to hear, even at times interpretations of the Bible that justify and solidify their own dominance. That is the reason as you've been here at Brentwood Christian, we've so often emphasized, I hope as you read through a text, not what does the text say to me, but what is the historical background? What is the literary context? All right, what is the theological context for this? What does it mean in that? And then finally, after hearing all that, then we bring it back and say, okay, now what does it mean in this time? Uh, 
Jeremiah in chapter 17 writes uh, this, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it, right? The, the depth of our sin and the fact that sin not only alters our actions, it actually makes us look and desire those things that are not in God's will. Uh, again, the historical example that always comes to my mind is the, uh, the German church in the 1930s. Adolf Hitler worked behind the scenes to get one of his leaders elected as, as being in charge of the Protestant Church of Germany. So that the German Christian Church came, in a sense, to be a reflection of power of the Nazi Party. In that context, there were individuals, like one of my heroes, Karl Barth, another one that I'm... Mr. Harper has told you about that I've mentioned a couple of times, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who became members of the confessing church that confessed only Jesus as Lord, not the Fuhrer. All right. So, again, I, I think this is a critical point as we work through the world that, as, especially as Christians are find power and are put in positions of power, it is incumbent upon us to be very, very aware of how that power can change us and alter our views. And last of all, critical theorists want to give special attention to the powerless and the vulnerable. And again, I think through all these passages of scripture, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 10, it says, the Lord your God is a God of gods, Lord of lords, a great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. The very end of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 8, right before the passage on the, the, the virtuous woman. The instruction in Proverbs, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, the rights of those who are destitute. Speak and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. And of course, one that I've heard me say in class several times, the end of, of James chapter 1. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world all right god is particularly concerned for those who are downtrodden who are oppressed we see that in the old testament we see that there in the book of james we see that in jesus's treatment of people in the way that the early church looked out for the the widows who were being overlooked in the early church in jerusalem we need to hear that For this afternoon, I look forward. I want to sit down and think with you about ways that uh, Scripture calls on us to respond to oppression and injustice. This is not the last word. We'll we'll talk tomorrow about some of the issues with uh, critical theory, some contrast between uh, historic Christian faith and our new critical theory. But till then. Let's not allow that to stop us from using this as an opportunity to, to grow in, in discernment and in wisdom and allow our hearts to be touched as well as our minds. I look forward to talking with you at 2 o'clock this afternoon. See you then. <laughs>